All right, all right. Basketball loving people, welcome to another episode of Gotta Get Up, a podcast for New York Liberty fans. My name is Erica L. Ayala. I am here with Misha Jones and Brian Florentin. And we are going to recap round one of the WNBA playoffs. We are also going to preview the semifinal matchups in the East and West. But Misha, you know we have to start with the series that we've been talking about here. And that is the New York Liberty Washington Mystics. Now, I think a lot of us thought we were going to go three. It would not come to pass. We did get an overtime game in game two. We also got another Natasha Cloud. Now, was it a guarantee? Maybe. I want to I get your thoughts on that um, in particular. But let's just start with overall. Um, you know, Washington came close but ultimately fell to the New York Liberty in overtime in game two. Uh, closing out their season. How how are the vibes? How are you feeling now that you had some time to reflect on the game? Honestly, um, still reeling a little bit. Still reeling a little bit. Just there's a lot of thoughts and about what could have been, um, and not just you know as it pertains to the outcome of this game, but so many things throughout you know the stretch of the season. Um, all the things that accumulated. Uh, into this huge mountain of adversity <laughs> for this for this DC team, um, but also a lot of warm uh, feelings about the way they fought back, um, about you know the the resilience they showed, about the individual you know breakout seasons that we saw. Um, you know, Brittany Sykes I think stamped herself and really put herself on the map this season. Natasha Cloud I think has been trending upward for some years now, but this. Obviously, you know, this this feels very uh, like her like her masterpiece uh, season thus far in her career. Um, and also, you know, some some question marks. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions that are going to surround this team as, as far as free agency, as far as health, as far as, you know, who they're going to keep, who's, you know, all those kind of things. Um, but at the bottom of that, there's still a little bit of a hurt for for what could have been. Um, but very happy, as we were just talking about before we recorded, Erica, just with the competitiveness le level of the series, um, the drama of it all. Uh, playoffs is all supposed to be about drama. So we got our a great dose of that. Um, but frankly, just really proud of, of what we saw from this group um, this season. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to talk about what happened and what transpired prior to game two which became a big storyline, including in probably the post-game graphics that the four-letter organization put out. Um, and that was, and we talked about it, right? We talked about it when we previewed this series, that Natasha Cloud guaranteed a Game 5 win. Uh, you know, I'm not going to do my Kurt Miller impression th tonight, but, um, <laughs> you know, we talked about how when Tosh Cloud, Brian, commits to something, she goes all in. And you and I were at that game. Before we get Misha's thoughts, I want to just have Brian chime in. You were at that game. You saw the guarantee that she was going to effectively uh, play Sabrina Ionescu a full 40 minutes, well, plus um, hard nose defense. Uh, because she felt that the Washington Mystics defense in game one was, quote, lazy. Uh, did Tosh Cloud make good on her guarantee, even though the Mystics came up with the, the loss? I would say that that game definitely, if she ever wanted to put an all defensive mixtape together, she could just grab her highlights from that contest and just like her level of dedication and focus and how she guarded Sabrina. Because I went back to watch game one before game two. And there were just so many moments where Washington just sort of like lapsed for a second. They took their eye off Inescu for like half a minute. They were they were too slow coming up on screens and she burned them every time. And that was something they had talked about in the series. So I think that she really took their poor effort to heart and really was like, because I think she really made a commitment to just a level of dedication, detail, and focus that, that champions provide, and she is a champion. And I think that she was really able to really just show just how dedicated and great she is. And I think it also, on the other side, it shows the level of, I think, respect paid to an opponent to be like, okay, you, you did so well against us the first time, I have to make sure that you don't get a single second to breathe. And I think she was able to accomplish that 
as the bells in the background will attest to, she really was able to put together such an amazing effort. And I thought that how she played really inspired the team because ultimately she was their full engine on both sides of the ball because the offense for Washington was still really stuck in the mud. John Quell had a great game against Deladon. Atkins wasn't able to get off in ways that we thought she could. And Brittany Sykes, outside of that one big basket late, didn't really put her imprint in game two. It was Natasha pretty much doing everything for 40 plus minutes, which I think is incredible. And I think speaks to just like the level of competitor she is and the level of hooper she is too. I mean, Brian said a whole lot there, Misha, but I said I wanted to get your thoughts as well from the Washington insider perspective. Uh, we also heard Eric Tebow make some comments after that. A lot of times with, when Tosh Cloud says those things, those are for her. So I want you also to speak not just about Tosh Cloud and her saying that and how that fits into her her identity as a player, but also when a player operates that way, you know, what is your take on, on just the psychology and the philosophy behind saying something so publicly um, and then having to back it up? Yeah, I'd say, you know, I do think it was a guarantee of what she would bring to the table. And I think she brought that and some more to the table. Um, I think as far as her saying those sorts of things, I can relate because that's that's the kind of player who plays off of heart and pure will. Like, yes, she has skill. Yes, she understands the game. Yes, yes, yes. Ticks all those boxes to be able to play at a WNBA caliber level, but to be able to compete the way she does. And I think people use that word a lot and it gets misconstrued competing. You know, it looks different for a lot of people, but Tosh is one of those those folks that and, and if you've seen the video that circulated from Ari Chambers, uh, courtside, one of the timeouts they're coming out. And Tosh, you see her find Sabrina Inescu and she's in her stuff. She's she's up under her. Her face is like, you know, you're not going to beat me. Um, and that's a kind of a player that I can ex totally respect. I respect that drive. I respect that willingness to, to take a chance because it was a chance. Tosh Cloud relies on her skills and she knows what she has. But the rest of us out here, we were on Twitter that entire time before the game started like, oh, I wonder if she's going to you know, live up to the to the table she set for herself. Um, but as a competitor, you know, I understand that. I understand the psychology of it because you need something to feed off of. And one thought that I had as the game continued on, it was about third quarter, end of the third quarter, Mystic started to heat up a little bit more. The momentum came back. Um, and I was just looking at Tosh Cloud and it's moments like that where okay, you said something pregame and you've backed it up to this point, that's also a little extra burst of momentum because you're like, look, I'm doing it. Not only on defense, but on offense as well. As we saw, she scored 33 points, the most she's ever scored in a playoff game in her career. So I think that also served as another jolt of energy. But for me, um, you know, I, I can appreciate that kind of a player. Um, and wow, I'm just, I just wish it could have ended differently for her um, and for this team as a whole. Yeah. And I mean, the, the thing I want to add is that what were people saying after that? Of course, Sabrina Ionescu is asked about it. Um, the Liberty, maybe not explicitly, but they had nothing but great things to say about Tosh Cloud and about the Washington Mystics. And then you also heard what Elena Deladon said from the dais. She was the first member of the, the players, I should say, from the Washington Mystics to speak to media post game. And, you know, she felt, and obviously right after the game, but she felt um, like a regret or a remorse almost that she herself and the rest of the Mystics couldn't match Tosh Cloud's intensity. And, you know, it was, it, it was a tough game. It was a tough post game because even though the Liberty won, you get the sense that both teams know that it could have gone down Anyway, I mean, especially we saw like the lapses, the missed free throw by Sabrina Ionescu, which then led to her having to intentionally miss a free throw. Uh, you know, so many wilds, just uncharacteristic turnovers. Um, and one of the things that Sabrina said is, you know, listen, this is where you take the win. I, Courtney Vandersloot added that it's a game. Yeah, exactly. You take the win. <laughs> Court, Courtney Vandersloot added, this is a game that we have to learn from. And it sounded like she was 
a little reserved with how she wanted to classify the game because she wanted to make sure that the team looked back on it. Um, and I think that was more insular, right? Things that they need to be able to control better. So it, again, just um, not what I would say is your average elimination game or even your average, you know, advancing into the semifinal game. And that to me just shows how much each team put out on the court. But Brian, you and I were in the scrum. Um, Sabrina, I do think at some point got just tired of answering the question. But we know, <laughs> Brian, you and I know how Sabrina how she operates. And there is one thing that she said that I thought was absolute fact. And I don't remember if you and I were talking about it or if I was talking to somebody else, but I said, listen, if, if it's a guarantee, cause I take Tosh cloud guarantees very seriously. I do. I as my, you should, I as we all right. should clearly. <laughs> hello. Hello. I don't play around. I was like, Oh, she's that's, that's going to happen. So if I'm Sabrina or the New York Liberty, what did I, I think you and I, Brian talked about it. I said, Sabrina is going to have the ball in her hands a majority of the time. We talk a lot on got to get up a podcast for New York Liberty fans that Sabrina Ionescu is better as the two off the ball, which is why they brought in Vandersloot. But if someone is going to play Sab that way, then give Sabrina the ball and let everybody else find open space. And effectively, Brian, I feel like that's what Sabrina did. That's what she told us after the game, that she knew as soon as Toss said what she said, that her teammates were going to go off. And it led to, Brian, the best performance that we've seen from Brianna Stewart against the Mystics this season. Yeah, the best way I can sort of think about it is like if you guys watch the NFL and there's a lockdown corner who's like, oh, this one person is not going to get it. <laughs> it's like this one person is not going to get anything. So with, with one person out the way, everybody else can eat. And that's what Sabrina was hinting at in post game two, where it's like, oh, if their best defender is off chasing me all day, everyone else has room to sort of get off and do what they, what they need to do. And we saw that really with Stewart because – Sandy pulled a great trick late in the game was that she sort of like used Sabrina as a decoy and had her just in the corner repeatedly, just like just just standing there, just out the way to keeping Cloud with her and letting Stewart bring the ball up the court. And when she could have Della down against her in more space, able to go downhill, get to the basket in that regard. So I think that was a great adjustment by the Liberty and being able to recognize that, okay, her shot isn't here right now. We don't want to force it and and sort of like have her throw up bad shots late in the shot clock just to sort of prove some, some kind of point. I think it takes great teamwork and great trust in each other as a team to be like, okay, you ain't got it tonight. Just be a decoy. Still be, still be active. Do what you do, but you're not going to be shooting. And then we'll let everybody else bring it home, which I thought was really fantastic. And it allowed for Stewart to get have her best game against the Mystics. Probably her second best game against Washington all season, combining regular and post. And Laney was able to continue doing what she did again. And most importantly, JJ was able to have even more room in the paint most because you're a, like yep, mm -hmm. your, yep, your top defender is off 30 feet away meanwhile you get to use your size length strength and athleticism in the post and that really allowed her to really make this her series in a really special way yeah and i think what we also saw brian was the composure from the new york liberty because washington for a decent amount of this game um especially early and then um early in the second half they had times where they were, you know, kind of, they were setting the pace. They were getting stops. They were making things difficult for the New York Liberty. You alluded to Sabrina Ionescu, one being, we all talked about her being guarded by Tosh, but also like the shot maybe not there, what she wanted it to be. Um, and I think the Mystics for a time, they were able to collect a, a decent amount of stops and, find their way both teams at times had misses uncharacteristic misses you know blown bunnies um, smoked layups yeah smoked. just oh. very odd Stop that was a little it. odd yeah it was it was very odd um 
Well, all the more reason why rebounding was critically important. We talked about how turnovers were going to be a massive impact on this game. But something else that we that we talked about in our preview of this series, Misha, and I'm curious to get your thoughts first on if at all, and if so, how you feel the coaching and the coaching experience impacted this series because it's something that we talked about i i was able to talk to eric tebow before between game one and game two i suppose and i asked him what are the differences when you're in the head coaching role and effectively his answer was you know i know what has to get done because i've seen it done i've been involved in conversations in post game and championship runs the difference is i've been involved as opposed to being the person that has to finalize things and has to make the final decision and so he felt that that was the biggest change but I want to go back to the question actually that Brian had asked us in our preview and get your thoughts do you think that coaching was a difference um, in this game at all or in this series excuse me um, not one that was like a f- the reason the Mystics lost if you get what I'm saying I don't think this is something this isn't a situation where as soon as the, the buzzer sounds, oh, Eric Tebow's got to go. I don't think that's the conversation that's being had right now at all. Um, far from it, even, you know, even considering the fact that they made it this far is already, you know what I mean? It's already, it's already feathers in his cap. Um, and I think when it comes to the game plans, I think he's stuck with exactly what this team's, you know, core values are. And that's defense first. Um, I saw really few things wrong with, with how he went about, adjusting game one to game two I thought they did exactly what they were supposed to do they you put your best you guard defender I mean you can you can debate whether that's Natasha Cloud or Brittany Sykes but you put one of your top perimeter defenders on their you know the the hole that needed to be plugged in game one he did exactly what he needed to do there um I do think I would have liked to see more stuff run through Brittany Sykes and more stuff uh specifically to get her buckets um, I know the pace, you know, at a certain point, it just started getting erratic and everybody started getting up and down the floor. Um, but this was a game where if you talk about uh, defense is king on one put one player and allowing the rest of the offense to get going, Elena Deladon just did not have it. You know what I mean? She just did not have it. Um, and for Eric Tebow as a coach, knowing that this is your world class, this is your top salary, this is your, you know, supposed to be your go-to and you can't quite go to or the way you really want to and that's no Tino shade because I love some EDD um he had to adjust and I think that's something I would have liked to see more of um I think not just this game throughout the season uh there's a lot of moments where the Mystics just get away from attacking the glass when they need they're a kind of team who you have to continue to attack the glass you can take the open three on a rebound kick out you can take the open three in transition but that's not going to be that can't be your bread and butter. You can't live and die by the three. They needed to get to the free throw line more, in my opinion. Um, and they just, like like Landon Deladon said in the presser after the game, they needed to find a way um, to, you know, r- rise to Tasha Cloud's level. And that's not something that Eric Tebow can step on the court and do for them. Um, but I think, you know, he he captained the ship as, as best he could this season um, in these playoffs. And I can't wait to see how he grows as a coach from, from this season to next. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's an obvious question just because of what we talked about. Um, But I want to get your take on this, Brian, but from Sandy Brondello's perspective, obviously she has a lot more experience as a head coach, was taken to task and down to the wire as these two teams did go into overtime. But what I heard Misha saying is that it's just, and we're nitpicking here, just, you know, we don't know T, no shade, as, as Misha says. Um, this, is, this is us talking. We're talking at an elevated basketball level, which is why I love having these two on. But this is what you do, right? This is what Washington is going to do. This is what every team that's eliminated is going to do. They're going to start breaking these things down so that they're better for next season. So with that said, did, what did you see from Sandy? Sandy Brondello and her coaching staff that you liked? Um, and what are some things that you're going to be looking out for as far as decision making when it comes to their series in the semifinals against the Connecticut Sun? Something I liked, and it was born out of necessity in game two, was the use of Kayla Thornton. 
KT has been so valuable for this team all season, and the fact that Sandy could count on her to play with her big with her other four starters when Laney got in foul trouble was super valuable. And it, even in game one, she only played a few minutes, but she still made a bunch of impact blocks, some good steals. So she was really able to really maximize her time on the court. And I think just her presence really adds on to what New York does, gives them more size, more physicality on the perimeter and on and on the glass, which is a great thing for them. Something I'm looking forward to next round is probably how Sandy uses Johannes. MJ really didn't, this really wasn't her series. Like those Washington guards really proved to be trouble for her. So Sandy didn't, Sandy turned to her for a little bit. She didn't really, after she made like a couple mistakes, that was pretty much it. And then she rolled with her starters plus KT the rest of the way through. With, with the longer series, I'm interested to see how she is able to adjust to Connecticut. She did have success against them in the regular season. So I wonder if Sandy could sort of like tap back into that for her so she feels more comfortable back on the court. And because Connecticut's guards are still good. So they're not, but I don't, I, I wouldn't say that they're on the level defensively of a Sykes and Cloud combo. So that might open things up for her a little bit more too. So I'm interested to see how she uses the rest of the bench with, with um, Johannes and Stephanie Dawson as well. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, and I think you're right. Thornton, a humble six points in a little bit over 17 minutes of work. She hit, had a plus minus plus five. Um, you know, so like you said, and we've been talking about KT in this way, is it always, you know, numbers sky high no but it's the right play at the right time and Benajelani was very frustrated in that game uh we've talked about this before generally speaking um but the frustration was I would say uncharacteristic almost she did get teed up um and that was something where she found her way back but had not had it not been for KT being able to s provide that stability, right? You know, um, we call AT for Connecticut the engine. I've been calling Benaja for the Liberty the anchor. And she didn't have that um, in, in game two, but Kayla Thornton did. So I like that. What I will say about the chess match that was the coaching, and it was actually something that Washington said they, they wish they would have challenged. I think they said something, something about JJ and um, I forget what it was now. Maybe the, I think it might've been on that, that um, intentionally missed free throw, which I think some people missed that uh, Sab missed the second free throw on purpose. Yes. Um, Erica, quick, quick distraction. I need people to like, Follow the reporters when we talk to you in post game. Like, guys, you can get your negative. Off. Like, we're here talking to people. Like, you can, you can, you can, you can get your agendas off, but have have a factual basis in the first, please. I yeah. beg. Yeah, yeah, uh. yeah. I just was like, I, I, yeah, I had to disengage. As a matter of fact, I don't know if it, intentional or not, but um, the universe saw fit to to boot me out of my main. Uh, Twitter account, so I can't even uh, get off. You can't page. even help. You, only, you can't even get on and nope. set the record straight. You will, right. You will only be hearing from me via Black Rosey Media and some of the other sites. But yeah, I was just like, okay, like, you know. You open anyway. yourself up to it when you miss the first one. As somebody who has no, always true. been like, free throws are the one thing I am not negotiating on. Like, you have to hit free throws Career. when it matters. Correct. I agree. But yes, y'all got to, people got to relax. They got to understand yeah, strategy. Just like, you're down oh, two at that point. Yeah. If you get one, yeah, you know, exactly. you're leaving it up the chance a little bit. So Yeah, anyway, so check out Black Rosie Media YouTube because we have Sabrina talking about that play and the breakdown and talking about, yeah, d didn't plan to miss the first one, but had to do this flawlessly. Felt good about giving JJ the opportunity to it get a It was a great miss also. Talk yeah. about a skill. That's hard to do too. So Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. So anyway, but um, I wanted to talk. We went on a little tangent there. There was um, – Washington talked about, oh, maybe we should have challenged this or reviewed this. There were two plays down the wire – and of course, I don't have my notes in front of me right now, but there were two plays down the wire where the New York Liberty, I think, benefited from review. One was a coach. The second one was a coach's challenge. The other one was it was just late in the game and they, they called for a review. 
Now, I didn't think either one necessarily was review territory. It looked pretty straightforward to me. But Misha, there are reasons that you call a review that are not always to win the review, including perhaps getting and squeaking out an extra timeout where yeah. you can game plan. Yeah. I think that from my observation, and this is not something that Sandy addressed explicitly, um, so I, I can't speak with certainty, but it certainly looked to me like at least in one of those scenarios that the New York Liberty opted to challenge so that they could reset their team, take a little breather, and, you know, um, kill some time. That's what we call gamesmanship. And that, to me, yeah. in addition to, as Sabrina said, her absolutely screaming at the top of her lungs, <laughs> miss, 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 um, and having her team know not only just because, I mean, it's one thing to miss, and as you said, to miss so perfectly. And Sabrina talked to us about how those are things, if you come to our practices, we practice those things, end of game scenarios. And so for me, the short thing is Sandy and those timeouts or challenges and the gamesmanship there. But the long tail of it all is having an experienced coach know that you need to practice those kinds of things throughout the season and not just when you get to postseason. Um, Misha, your thoughts on from the coaching perspective on the gamesmanship of using challenges, um, maybe to squeak out extra timeouts and why one would do that. Um, but then also the importance of, mm, I don't know. Yeah, we talking about practice. <laughs> <laughs> Both are extremely important. Um, to, to talk about the timeouts first. As a coach, you want the, the perfect world is where you get 12 timeouts all in the fourth quarter to use whenever you want to 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 <laughs> to settle your team down, to change the play. Once you go out there, you see what the other team's defense is in. Timeouts are a coach's best friend. And if there is a way to get an extra timeout or extra time to talk to your team or at least your point guard or whoever's going to be involved in your next offense or defensive, you know, situation, you take that and you you do whatever you can with that moment. And I am so here for it. It's not cheating. It's very much within the rule book. It's just smart. It's smart coaching. It's like you said, Sandy Brondello, uh, just, just being a veteran in that sense. Um, and yeah, so I hope folks, I really hope folks are, are paying attention to the intricacies. If you're, if we're talking about, you know, discussing basketball at a high level, that's just one of those intricacies. Um, and then I forgot the second part of your question. My, my bad, Eric. <laughs> no, no, you're all good. The the idea, because I went on forever, because I just love this. Like, I geek out about this stuff. But the idea of practicing yeah. end-of-game scenarios throughout the season. They have to be practiced. Because it's something that, as a coach, ideally, you don't want to have to take more than 10, 15 seconds after you've already drawn up, you know, the more complex whatever situation you're in. You want your players to already be on that time. You want them to be able to look at each other and be like, oh, you finna miss? All right, we gonna miss, we gonna get this rebound. Because the more you have to discuss it, the more the other team is in on what's happening. And you don't, you know, it, I hate to do the football thing again, but it's the same thing in football. You know what I mean? You have to understand the play calls. You have to understand what each moment calls for. Um, and yeah, I think uh, if you don't practice that from, from I mean, beginning of the season, coaches have different philosophies, but throughout the season so that everybody's on the same page when you get to that moment. And nobody's shook, frankly. People feel like they're used to that situation. They know what to do and their nerves are, are more calm. Um, then, yeah, that's what you want. You never want to put your team in a situation they've never been in uh, in the playoffs in overtime. <laughs> yep. Preparedness, preparation. I mean, and this is why it was interesting to hear so many people um, yes, I'm going to call out Tarika Foster Brasby because one, I, I got to be consistent. Um, <laughs> but also cause I, I like teasing her, but you know, Tarika, she, that's why she kind of, she got me with that, you know, their overrated kind of scenario because this is a team that was coming together. Um, you know, as much as people were definitely doubting Washington, um, what I loved is that throughout all of that and, Tosh said it again. She said, any other team, if you take out three of their starters, where would they be? Would they be in the playoffs? And so we leaned in. I think, generally speaking, people can lean into that narrative. But for whatever reason, 
it's hard sometimes for people to to realize how hard you have to work to build team chemistry that doesn't come from nowhere the aces being a super team this season didn't start this season it started when bill lambeer built the franchise as a general manager and head coach and if you listen to what bill lambeer said he gave the keys to asia wilson and why would he do that? Why would you give the keys to, to a brand new franchise to a rookie and then have her work through an injury, have her work through disappointing semifinals, disappointing finals, and still give her the keys because he saw the vision of 2022 and beyond. Same thing with the New York Liberty. I think, and we talked about this before, the keys will eventually go to Sabrina Ionescu, but you can't do that if unless Jonathan Cole brings in a veteran point guard, unless he brings in uh, veterans who can play off the bench, like Steph Dolson, like Kayla Thornton. That doesn't. That's not going to happen. And we saw it. We saw it early under Walt Hopkins. Sabrina was there. And the team wasn't successful because you didn't have the elements and the pieces. And a part of that is the right personnel. But the other part of that is what Sandy Brondello has been doing, which is building the chemistry. And so I think it's going to be really interesting because the New York Liberty are taking on another team that has really nailed being a steady, consistent franchise, regardless of pieces coming in and out regardless of injuries, and that's the Connecticut Sun. People don't want to give the Sun credit, but they have been a consistent team, top consistent top three team. No team in the WNBA over the last five to seven years has been consistently in the top four like the Connecticut Sun has. No team, period. So now you have a team that's doing this for the first time, and a team that's done, or a franchise that's done this, but has a new head coach. Yeah, I'm very curious to see what this matchup is going to be. That being said, the New York Liberty have owned the regular season matchup. And we did see that the Connecticut Sun stumbled a little bit against a Minnesota team that got their chemistry late. But Brian, I'll go to you first. What do you like about the matchup? I know we talked about this a little bit post game. What do you like about the matchup about Connecticut? And what do you think are some things that the Liberty need to be mindful of um, and not get tripped up by the Connecticut Sun team when we go to a best of five semifinal? One thing I liked was that aside from sweeping the regular season series, they won two nail biters in Connecticut, including a, I think it was a, 16 point comeback in the last Connecticut meeting. So this group knows that they can go into Uncasville in a pressure game and win. And they're able to do it in a variety of ways. In the in the first Connecticut win, KT was was in the final five over Sabrina and they were able to win. In the comeback game in August in Uncasville, the JJ powered them to victory in that game. So they're able to beat them in a different in a in a variety of ways with a variety of contributors. So that's that's a great thing to always call back to and something that i i think is going to be big for them that i like and 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 this ties similar to the washington series is jj's play on the interior john quo really in those connecticut games like she really took it to them on the inside and in the last game in barclays to, to wrap up the regular season she got it she got them in there again so having that interior presence is going to be massive and her athleticism can help her switch on other players as well too so it gives them a full a full sort of swiss army knife of a center who can handle every assignment given to her and i think that presence is really going to allow new york to own the paint and sort of like cut off drives if she switched onto players like Natisha Heideman or Beck Allen, be able to contest them on the perimeter and really give New York that flexibility to really attack in different ways. I like that you talked about JJ um, because we've talked about this before on the podcast, but in hockey, there's a term called like a revenge game. And we've even seen the New York Liberty use that a little bit just because I had so many new players this year. 
But I feel like John Paul Jones does lean into that more hockey sense of a revenge game. When you play the team that you most recently played for, you kind of go off. Um, and I think that's a pride thing. But I also think it's it's the who do the Connecticut Sun know best on the New York Liberty? Of course, they know John Paul Jones. So she has to have a stellar game because if not, she's not going to be able to impact the game the way she usually does when the New York Liberty play almost any other opponent because of what, because of the chemistry that you build when you're in the trenches, when you're in practice, when you're on the road with teams and Connecticut knows John Quell Jones. And so now John Quell Jones in turn also knows Connecticut. So in some ways can figure out, you know, has the, the, the hacks and all the, the cheat codes to be able to do that. So I think John Quell once again is going to be the factor here. But before we swing over to the next series, which will be Dallas and the Aces, which I think will also be a perimeter battle, Misha, thoughts on do you think that Connecticut has enough firepower from the perimeter to make things interesting if and when they have to, to really rely on on distance shooting against this Liberty squad. Erica, we, we here, we here because I didn't know what question I want y'all to know. We don't, I, I don't know what question she about to ask. And I thought you were just going to say, what are your keys to the game? And the first one I was going to say was guards shooting the ball plus the one Bonner. Um, I don't know. I really don't know if they have enough in the clip and that's me just being, you know, my mom also loves the Connecticut Sun. All right, she she loves the Mystics, but she also loves her since Melissa Thomas has she, since she's in, was at Maryland. So I'm like, you know, very much that's where I'm coming from with this perspective. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they have it. I don't know if they have it. I think uh, Ty Harris is going to be a key, and Beck Allen is going to be a key. Um, not only offensively but defensively, because when Heidemann, you know, goes out, goes to the side. It's going to be Ty Harris who steps up and guards, you know, Courtney Vandersloot, guards Sabrina Nescu, whatever the case may be. Um, in the same situation with Beck Allen against Benai Jelani, or sometimes getting switched onto Stewie, um, who I think will be primarily matched up with Alyssa Thomas here. And that's also something to talk about, you know. Um, but I don't, I don't know if they have it. I don't know if they have enough in the clip and what that means to me is they're going to have to control the pace of this game if they want a chance. If they want a chance to win, they're going to have to slow New York down. And even though, you know, Connecticut's a team that scores in bunches off of turnovers, Alyssa Thomas, as we know, loves to get that ball out the rim and get down the court in a hurry. Um, this is It's going to be tough. Can they execute in their half court if they slow the pace down? Or if they decide to, to okay, we're going to move like it's a track race, you got to take care of the ball. You have to rebound, and I don't know that they have the strength in the interior to rebound with John Quell and with Brianna Stewart, um, but that's another thing. It's it's which JJ and which Stewart do you get? You know what I mean? And I think from looking at the season series, yeah. uh, New York fans are, are feeling good about that going in, um, but frankly, you know, another one of my, my key things I'm looking at is JJ and AT. Frankly, and I'm going to say it, it's the battle of the personalities. Like, who wins that battle? Who wins that battle of getting the other person frustrated? Who lets that creep into their game more? Who lets that creep into their production more, um, if at all? And if not, then, you know, we just get a good old-fashioned cruising for a bruising kind of game. But, um, <laughs> you know, you know, put, put them up. Put them up. All that. Um, put them but, yeah, up. To, to answer your first question, I don't know. I don't know if Connecticut's got enough in the clip. I think it's going to be interesting. And you mentioned rebounding because another part of me wants to is, is curious if they just kind of hedge their bets there, because when you shoot from distance more often than not, that rebounds also coming and bouncing back out. So then you nullify to some extent as much as possible having to fight in the paint. So it's just something to, because that's, that's gamesmanship and skill as well, uh, if you think about it. So, um, all right, but Brian, I want to come to you. I know we talked about this a little bit, um, but any final thoughts on um, Connecticut and New York before we switch gears to Dallas and Vegas? Ooh For this series, I'm wondering who I guess I feel like Nigel Laney is going to be a big source for New York. I guess the big thing I'm wondering is like, 
because usually teams put their weakest defenders on Laney, and she's been punishing them every time in the in the low post. So I wonder how Stephanie White is gonna think of the defensive matchups, and whoever gets Laney is gonna be the person that they probably pick on, so to speak. So I wonder about that. And also off the bench for Connecticut, I know Bijane has recently gotten back. But I wonder if she'll be full strength because they're going to need a big series from her on the, on the perimeter when she gets in. I believe she finished second in the sixth in the sixth play of the year vault. So she's definitely been acknowledged for her great play. And they're going to need a really fantastic series from her on both sides of the ball if they want to pull this off. Yeah, good point. Good point. All right. Now is when we talk about the Dallas Wings who able who were able to annihilate. Atlanta, I mean, it was, you know, it was pretty bad. And then Vegas took care of Chicago as well. So these are two teams um, who were able to be rested, unlike Connecticut. Connecticut's the only team that had to go the distance in the first round. Um, what do you like, Misha, about this matchup? And you can take it any way you want but it's going to be Dallas, the only team that's beaten every team in the top three, and then Vegas, who for the – especially in the first half, pre-All-Star, was dang near undefeat, undefeatable. Like, could not mess with them, had everything pop in. Um, so I want to start off by saying I think these two teams match up extremely well. I am so, – I didn't even realize I was excited about it until – both their series went final. And then I started thinking about it. And I was like, Dallas got Jeremy McCowan and Kalani Brown and something, something, and Ricky, and then Vegas. But they got point guard and they got, and it's just, I think it matched. I think they match up so well. Asia Wilson is going to have her hands full. She, Kia Stokes, and Elena Coates, if she gets some, some run in this one, they're going to have their hands full in the paint. Um, so for me, that's where it starts from the inside out. I'm wondering, you know, who edges out? Can Asia get off the way she needs to get off to, to produce the way she has for this team? Um, and then I also think, who do you put on Satu? You know, Satu, she, she's special. Obviously, winning the Most Improved Player Award, congratulations to her. Um, who do you put on Satu? She's got length. She can facilitate, okay? If you try to stop Arike, if you try to stop Crystal Dangerfield getting the ball where it needs to be, or you try to shut Arike down offensively, Satu is not no softy. Okay. She can put the ball in the hole and she knows how to find McCowan when help comes to her. She knows how to, th there's a lot of things with this one that I'm excited about. Um, and then for Vegas, I'm just wondering uh, what production they're going to get from the inside. And to me, Kelsey Plum, is she going to be Kelsey Plum that we know, or is she going to be the Kelsey Plum that ended the season kind of um, rough, you know, cause when you have time off, folks always talk about it. Like it's a, it's a, a completely net positive thing it can also be a net negative thing you know what I mean Becky Hammond one of the greatest coaches that will ever live I'm saying it now and you know it is what it is if you know you know you don't you don't but having that much time off for both Dallas and for Vegas it's it's going to be interesting to see who comes in um all guns blazing from jump um and who takes longer to settle in I think if Dallas takes longer to settle in it's not going to be pretty. Um, but Vegas, you know, there's a lot of question marks. There's a lot of question marks. Yeah. And I think we saw, right, the, the cracks in the veneer, the chinks in the chain, however you want to say it. <laughs> but um, who, if I remember correctly, right around All-Star, you had Vegas playing Dallas in that one home, one away series. Dallas almost got the first game. And then they came back to Arlington and handled business. Yep. Was it the prettiest? Who cares? They beat the top team. Take the win, um, right? Take the win. Mm -hmm. That's what we just heard from Sabrina. Um, I like, I think the point about Kelsey Plum is very astute. It has not been the Plum dog. It's been inconsistent from Kelsey Plum. And we know that Kelsey Plum being able to play the way she did, not to take anything away from Asia, Definitely not taking anything away from Chelsea Gray or Jackie Young. But remember, when Kelsey Plum missed a game or two, um, just with a little, just needed some rest, what did we hear from the team? That she's their energy source. Mm -hmm. And this team needs K Plum to be that energizer bunny type running around. But Brian, 
there's another player that I think could be interesting in this matchup because Misha, they already mentioned Satu Sabali, Unicorn, Swiss Army Knife, whatever you want to say. Now, this is a player that would be coming off of the bench, but has little sprinklings of some of what makes Satu special. And for me, that's that's Bell. Mm. Yeah, I I think Vegas, I think, excuse me, Dallas's bench is going to come in. They have, because since Vegas runs a really thin bench, you, 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 it's really just one player they trust off that bench. Sometimes Sid, who has a nice TV show, I might add. But uh, she's not really going to see much of when it comes to playing time in this series. So Burton off the bench, Kalani Brown off the bench is going to be big for Dallas. So I think being a, I think LT being able to turn to her bench a little bit more and have that size coming off the bench. So that way they're big all 40 minutes. I think that's going to be a big factor. So I'm excited to see how, how she manages those rotations and how she manages to utilize her size in this matchup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, shout out to Kirsten I know you want to, I, yeah. I knew you wanted to get in on that. I knew you wanted to get in on that. <laughs> you know how I was going to do it. Shout out to Kirsten Bell. Shout out FGCU. Shout out to homegirl Tyra Cox who went there, won some, uh, some chips with that team. But yes, Kirsten Bell is somebody I've been so excited to see blossom as a pro because if you watched her at FGCU at the college level, she score. she's a bucket. She's a bona fide bucket. Her confidence is through the roof. Her energy never changes. She's long. She's tall. She's athletic. Um, and against this Dallas Wings team, this is exactly the kind of player you need to come off the bench and guard Satu or give Satu a couple buckets, post her up, be physical with her, um, and kind of, you know, offer offer a counterattack uh, to what, you know, I call her unicorn because I think, I think it fits perfectly. But to, to counteract uh, her impact on the game, I think she has to be top of mind when we're looking at matchups and uh yeah I'm so glad you brought her up because I was like Kirsten Kirsten is is the kind um who I think could have a breakout series you know what I mean those players that you haven't seen uh play a major role in the regular season yep. she gets her sprinklings like you said but in a series like this when the matchups are the way they are she could be an x-factor for sure yeah I really think uh I agree with you on Becky Hammond coach of the year uh or just like well, she's not coach of the year. We don't know who coach. Well, sorry, Steph. Steph White is coach of the year. LT was my pick for coach of the year. But <laughs> as an all-time great coach, Becky Hammond, former coach of the year, um, I'm very curious. And she's been critical of herself after a little bit of a smackdown from the New York Liberty. She was like, "Yeah, that's on me. I have to figure out how to get the bench more involved." We've seen Sid Colson go off since that game, since mm -hmm. those comments by Becky Hammond. But I do think Kirsten Bell, it just makes too much sense mm -hmm. against Dallas. And it's not really something that anyone has seen in long stretches. So this, if you have the confidence, if you allow what we talked about with Sandy mm -hmm. Brondello, have been working your bench in, if you've been working on things, game planning for what's next, even if it's not quite right for now, to me, the answer seems pretty straightforward and simple. And I think if you start giving Bell more responsibility, if it doesn't work, then you can always pull back. Yeah. But what you don't want is to then put her in a situation where it's like, you know, she's Julie the cat Gaffney that has to make a, a, a breakout stop, you know, in, in, you know, in, in, in a penalty, you know, shootout situation. Like that's yeah. not fair to anyone. Um, so I'm very curious to see what we have there. I mean, I think it was Washington actually, that was like, you know, not every team can have like six forwards and then they were like Dallas they were like no no shade no shade but like <laughs> I mean yeah Dallas is built to mm -hmm. win the battle of the boards yeah this is a, a Vegas team that and if they had Candace Parker healthy which I'm I'm we're thinking that we won't um haven't really had much I, I should say I haven't been plugged in since they ended their last series on what her status is um so this could be um, – uh, uh, we already – let me put it this way. We already know Dallas is a team that can expose what is usually a strength of Vegas, which is their perimeter play. And when you don't have a Candace Parker who can do what the New York Liberty have had Stewie do, which is bring the ball up just so you get a different look and you can get some of those post players activated because you're getting mismatches, 
um, that could be a little bit tough. And we've seen it's been a tougher road for Vegas down the stretch. But at the end of the day, we talked about this before, experience and veteran leadership in the postseason is what wins you WNBA championships. Pivotal. And that's what Vegas has in spades compared to a Dallas team that has made strides under LT. But is it enough? And this is not a three. We ain't playing no cute little three game. This is going to be a five game grudge match. Yeah. And the composure has been a question mark for Dallas. Um, and I know Brian and I were talking about this. The composure has been a question mark. It's been better, but it still has been a question mark. What version of Arike are we going to get from a leadership perspective? I'm not talking about what she's going to do from a scoring perspective. We already know what we're going to get there. But leadership, including how she impacts things defensively. Is she a defensive liability? I'm not sure I would go all the way live that far. That being said, she's not a Benajah Laney defensively. She's not a Brittany Sykes defensively. She's not a Tosh Cloud defensively. So it has to come from her basketball IQ. It has to come from her leadership. It has to come from her having the confidence to facilitate. And Brian, you and I talked about this. I think what is interesting about Arike is that she's starting to get to a place where she's like, listen, if I do these other things just a little bit more, yeah. that then opens me up to be the dynamic player that I am and that Dallas needs me to be and that I want to be as a superstar in this league. And I do think, Brian, that LT has figured out how to hit the right buttons at the right time. Yep, it's very much a, if I may not like the, the antics with the referees, but if you give me 5% more in here, I'll live with it. If, if it's a fine, we'll go 50-50, it's all good. Just give me some of that, give me some of this stuff that I really need, and then we're good to go. And I think especially for Enrique, she's a player who can, score at any time so if she's able to really play make good decisions when she has the ball keep the keep the flow of the offense going reduce some of those hero shots and just sort of like keep going within the flow give that effort on defense be locked in in that regard i think it i think it opens her up to an even higher level of ball play and i think it really makes dallas a little bit more intriguing because you're gonna have to throw your best defender at her when she's going off and then with that leads to more more opportunities for Satsu. Howard is a Swiss army knife that can do a lot of different things in the court. So once Arike is is pushing in the right direction with, with the rest of the team, everything else just almost like lifts as a default as a result. I love it. I love it. All right. The time has come for our predictions. You know how we do this. I let y'all make predictions. Let. I don't like doing that. Like, I don't, it's not permission. I <laughs> encourage us to make predictions however we see fit. Um, but we're going to get a five-game series. Dallas opens at Vegas, Connecticut <laughs> at New York Liberty. <laughs> um, first prediction, uh, talking about for both series, do we go five for both yes or no, Misha? No. Ooh, all right. Do you think either one goes five? Yes, I think um, Connecticut, New York can go five. Ooh, okay. Brian, what say you? I'm going to say no to both. They're not going to go five, but they're both going to be a really competitive four. Okay, okay. Mm, I'm, I'm definitely leaning to four games. And I actually think the series, if we get five, it's Dallas Vegas. But Interesting. Think, yeah. Ooh, okay. I think that if we go off of the regular season, the Dallas Aces, I mean, Misha, you said it. These teams match up really well. And if we go by regular season, and this is what I'm basing my prediction on, New York should be able to close out Connecticut off of regular season matchups and record. They should be able to shut that door. They have not given Connecticut any regular season wins this year. And both have been in the top three all season long. 
now that being said, wouldn't it be nice to <laughs> get over the hump in the semifinals? I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but I think I'll put it this way. For New York to be really, really, really real about all of their laying the foundation and getting our superstars in places and focusing first on getting our starters together and then working in our bench, if all of that progression was real and not just talk, then they need to close it out before they get to five. I could see maybe going four, but it's not. it cannot go to five. Um, on the other hand... Think about regular season struggles that Vegas has had on in the second half, the back end, including that Dallas has given them some fits and that Dallas has confidence coming out of their just annihilation <laughs> of Atlanta. Um, I like I like them to be the underdog. I like them to be the team that comes with the most bark and bite out of all the teams in the semifinals. And that's going to be a handful to give to Vegas. Does Dallas beat Vegas? I'm going to say no, but I do think they take them the distance. That's real. That's real. So we'll see. We will <laughs> see. If things get started this weekend. We've got on Sunday, September 24th, um, it will be Connecticut, as I mentioned, at New York Liberty. That's um, I was like 10 a.m. That's I forgot. I'm on the West Coast. <laughs> <Absolutely not. laughs> That's a, t- t- <laughs> you, oh, 10 no. a.m. Pacific time, a.k.a. 1 or p.m. Eastern time. And then you have Dallas at Vegas. That is 2 p.m. Pacific. So that's 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. First game is going to be on ESPN, and then the second game will be on ESPN 2. Then we go Sunday, Tuesday, Friday. Those are the games that are guaranteed, and then we figure out um, where it goes from there. Best of five series. Everything is set if we go all the way to end on Tuesday, October 3rd. But make sure you stick with us. This is Gotta Get Up, a podcast for New York Liberty fans. We've got Misha Jones. Brian Florentin in the house previewing mostly uh, the Liberty and Connecticut series. Of course, we had to just do a post-mortem on Washington at New York and hopefully give some good nuggets on the Dallas and Aces series as well. But make sure you follow Black Rosie Media. We'll have some nuggets. Brian, for sure, will be in the house in New York. We'll see what happens and I might catch up with him on the road for the finals, depending how it all goes down. But for Misha and Brian, I'm Erica L. Ayala, your host of Gotta Get Up a Podcast. Hey, for New York Liberty fans, Tosh Cloud, nothing but love from the Liberty fans as she was leaving the court. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Um, but yeah, catch us on Black Rosie Media YouTube for all of the post game interviews and whatnot. Until next time, peace out, everybody. Ha, ha, ha.